All right, so we are going to start the material for the last exam. So today we're going to start the combinatorics and we're gonna start at the very beginning. And I'm gonna do this as if you've never seen any of this stuff before, knowing it's quite likely that you have a fairly decent background or even just enough background for all of this to make hopefully good sense. And so today what we wanna start by doing is defining probability. Now, I'm not interested in solving problems yet. I'm interested in creating a situation where we have all of the right vocabulary and all of the understanding to be able to do a calculation of probability, whether it's a simple problem or a complicated problem. So there's a few different things that we have to define before we can define probability, okay? So the first thing is, is we always have something called an experiment. Now, I don't mean you're in a lab with the goggles and the beakers with all this, you know, steam and smoke coming out of them. You're a mad scientist doing an experiment. No, the experiment, that's kind of a loose term for what it is you're measuring. For example, my experiment could be, I'm going to flip a coin 10 times. That's my experiment. My experiment is I have a deck of cards and I display them for you and I say, pick a card, any card. That's my experiment. My experiment is I'm gonna roll the dice and look at the total. My experiment is I'm gonna stand on a street corner and count the number of cars that pass through each green light. I'm gonna do that for maybe the course of eight hours. That's my experiment. So the experiment is the thing that you're gonna be able to start counting things from. So it has to be well-defined. There are experiments that are complicated. So what do you mean complicated? For example, I want you to flip a coin until you get three tails in a row. Well, how many times do I have to flip the coin? I don't know. Maybe the first three. Maybe it takes 3,000. I don't know. But your experiment will be to do it until you have that outcome. That's a little more complicated. I want you to roll the dice until you get double sixes. <laughs> I don't know how long that's going to take. So most of the time when we talk about an experiment, we already know how many times we're going to do something. And each time we do something, that's called a trial. So I'm going to flip the coin 10 times. Okay, please mute yourself. And so you're going to have 10 trials of flipping the coin. Now, there's something called the sample space. Now, when we talked about sets and intersections and unions, I always drew the Venn diagram and we call that our universe. The sample space essentially is our universe. The sample space is every possible outcome of the experiment. So whatever the experiment is, it's every outcome. I'm gonna flip a coin one time. What are my possible outcomes? Well, I can flip a head, I can flip a tail. That's it. So my sample space would consist of one head or one tail, okay? If, but if I roll the dice, it turns out there's a whole lot of possible outcomes I can have from the dice roll. So the sample space for a pair of dice being rolled would be much, much larger, all right? Next, we have what's called excuse me, the event. The sample space is every conceivable outcome. The event are all the outcomes you are interested in, all the outcomes that you are trying to count. So I might do something like this. I want you to flip a coin 10 times, okay? I would like to know how many tails you get. So my event would be the number of tails, not the number of flips, that would be huge, but simply the number of tails you get. Or I want you to flip a coin and I want you to count all the ways that you can get at least, you know, three tails or five tails or seven tails or something like that. So the event is the specific outcome. Now, I can always count because experiments are finite. You're not going to flip a coin an infinite number of times. So usually we indicate like a capital S for sample space, keep it easy. An event, we often use a capital A or a capital B or a capital C. We keep, we usually don't have more than a couple of events going on. So if we define N of S is equal to the number of outcomes in S. Formally, it's often referred to as the cardinality. I don't like using that word because it just sounds too abstract and vague. Cardinality is exactly how many elements there are in a set. That's all that means, the word cardinality. So NS is the number of outcomes in S. NA is the number of outcomes in A. Okay. That's easy enough. Now we can finally define probability.
probability of event A occurring is, and what we usually use is capital P of A. That, that just makes our notation simpler. The probability of event A occurring is defined to be the number of outcomes in A over the number of outcomes in S. It's that simple. That is the definition of probability. There is no other, okay? Probability is something that can be measured. Now, the individual counts may be difficult because the numbers could be very, very large. So the combinatorics we're gonna learn is basically how we can count the numerator and the denominator. Now, let me, a couple simple questions. First of all, can the number of outcomes in A exceed the number of outcomes in S? Anybody wanna try that one? No. No, that wouldn't make any sense, okay? I'm gonna flip a coin three times. I want you to figure out how many ways I can get a thousand tails. Well, no, that's not possible because I only flipped it three times. The number of outcomes in A certainly can't, can't exceed the number of outcomes in S. In fact, the number of outcomes in A is an inequality. Anybody wanna guess between what and what? Zero and one. Between zero, the number of outcomes. Oh, S. S. Between the number and the number in S, exactly. Oh, could my, could my experiment involve, basically I counted everything, sure. If I ask you, um, I, I want you to flip a coin. I want you to flip a coin one time. What is the probability that you got an outcome? <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, what's the probability it landed? In other words, well, of course the answer would be one because <laughs> my event is the whole sample space. That, that is a kind of silly answer, but it's possible. So based on that statement right there, that puts a bound on probability. Probability must be between zero and one for exactly that reason. Oh, because if I divide everything here by N of S, N of S, N of S, that's the probability. So in words, we say, if something is impossible, the probability is zero. If something is certain to occur, the probability is one. Therefore, probability is usually between. And by the way, these are not strict inequalities. I can have a probability of zero. I can have a probability of one. It's going to be very rare that you get either one, but we're going to see situations where that, where that happens. Okay. Typically conditional probability problems. We'll see stuff like that happening. So probability is defined to be a quotient. So if the probability is a half, we say the probability is a half. So why would we ever use a decimal for probability? Hmm. Huh. So if the probability were a third, I wouldn't change that to a decimal. That wouldn't even make sense. So why is it you often see decimal values for probabilities? You may want to try that one. We, we, have, we have no reason to, to see a decimal for a little while, but why yeah. might... You can transfer it to persons very quick. There's no practical reason to ever have a decimal value for probability, except what if these numbers are really... What? Really? Really big? Really big. <laughs> yeah, I have a seven digit numerator and an eight digit denominator and I'm giving you the exact answer. But you're looking at that going, I haven't the slightest feel of how big that number is. The only reason you ever convert a probability to a decimal is because of the size of the fraction is not practical to try to look at. If your answer was a half, a half, your answer is three sevenths, it's three sevenths. Why would you, first of all, you never change a rational number that has an infinite decimal sequence to a terminating decimal sequence. Mathematically, that makes no sense. But we can say, oh, I'm gonna approximate my probability to be this. And we're gonna find it is often the case that it is practical to convert our answer to a decimal because of the sheer size of the numbers. That's the problem. So when we're doing the combinatorics, we can have numerators and denominators that are astronomically large. And so writing it as a fraction, although correct, isn't extremely useful. Because again, I'm looking at that going, I don't know. Now, um, if you watch basketball, they'll always give you the percentage of the time the person makes their shots. Like this guy's an 87% free throw shooter, or, you know, he makes this, or if you're a baseball player, you know, here's the batting average. They give you a decimal value and that's, that's fine. People can look at that and have a pretty good idea, 
But if I said, you know, the basketball player, oh, this year he's taken 3,647 shots and he's made 1,923 of them. You go, oh, okay, that's great. Is that good or bad? Well, we probably want to convert that fraction to a decimal because then it makes it really easy to interpret. Oh, he's shooting above 50% and below 50%. So in probability, we often speak in percentages. We speak in percentages. Probability is not percent period. Okay. And many of you will answer every probability question with a percent. Probability is not percent. That is probability. That is not a percent. <laughs> that is probability. That is not a percent. It is acceptable to give a decimal answer. When you're speaking in English, if my probability is 0.5, it's one half, we can say, ah, this is going to occur 50% of the time. That's a correct English statement. You don't say the probability is 50%, okay? 50 is a number. <laughs> it's not between zero and one. 50% has to be converted back to a decimal before it's a probability again. So lest we forget, you don't give a percent answer because the percent answer would always be outside the range of a probability answer. And But when you're speaking English, we often say that. Now, some people will use odds. That, that's a totally different subject. They'll use odds when they're talking about probability. Odds are not probability. Odds come from probability, and probability can come from odds. That's true, but odds are not probability. Odds are something completely different. If I said, I'm going to flip a coin, what sort of English language do we use when we talk about a coin flip? We use this in everyday life. We'll say, oh, something's a coin flip. You're not actually flipping a coin. What, what numbers do we always throw at you when, when we're talking about that? What are the two one numbers? And, we say two. something is one and two. Is that how you speak? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, oh, uh, there's there's a game being played, and you think I, like right now I have Wimbledon on in the background, and let's say these people are evenly matched. So we say, oh, this kind of oh, 50 50. 50 50. Yeah, don't we all we speak that way? When we say something's 50 50, what are we saying? Oh, we're saying we believe that. Each side of the proposition is equally likely to occur. Let's just say it that way. Because if it's a sporting event, we say each team or each individual is equally likely to win. Um, I have a decision to make, and I don't know which way to go because I could go either way. You know, so we say it's 50-50. What are we saying? We're actually giving odds. Okay. 50-50 and one-to-one -one are the same thing. It means one for, one against, one out of two likelihood. Okay, so that's that's where the term comes from. I'm going to flip a coin exactly one time. I can get tails, I can get heads. We would say that's a 50-50 proposition. All of us would agree that's the English language we use, but mathematically, what are we saying? Oh, I have a one out of two, one half probability of each outcome. That makes sense. 50% of the time I should get one, 50% of the time I should get the other. That's where the term 50-50 comes from. But it's also the same as saying the odds are one to one, one for, one against. Oh, okay. That's that's language. We don't we don't do odds. We're not worried about that. That's something something a little bit different. So with this in mind, let's do a really simple experiment. <clears throat> All right. So my experiment is going to be we're going to flip a fair coin three times. Okay, we want to find the probability of exactly two tails. Okay, so based on what I said, hopefully we, we can we understand what's the experiment, what's the sample space, what's the event, we can calculate. Okay, the idea is don't give me an answer. Let's let's break it down into the components that go into the answer. So I'm going to flip a coin three times. And by the way, why do I use a word like fair coin? Why don't I just say flip a coin? And by it's redundant. When we say things like flip a coin or roll the dice, we, it's always implied that it's fair. But what does that even mean that it's fair? Anyone want to guess when I say a fair coin? Uh, so like the weight is even on two sides, so it doesn't uh, go wrong. Yeah. yeah, so it doesn't. Um, I don't know the word in English, but it doesn't land. It doesn't land. So the, the probability of landing on one side is 
same on yeah kind that's, of. that's exactly what it means it, it actually it's the physics of the coin saying the weight distribution is such that it is not more likely to land one than the other you know if you went back in you know in ancient history and you, you know go back to like the early romans and you found a denarius Right. And that's the one, you know, with the Caesar's head on one side and all that. That's where all that comes from. I really doubt, besides the fact that it's probably not even flat, I really doubt it's going to be evenly distributed that one side's going to land exactly half the time. I, I just don't think that's the case. But when we say a fair coin, we want where the weight distribution is such. And I always have fun with this because what's the extreme? What's the most unfair coin? Everyone knows, of course, is a Harvey Dent coin. Everybody knows what a Harvey Dent coin is, right? You guys have all seen Batman. What's a Harvey Dent coin? Anybody I don't know. know? It has heads on both sides. <laughs> so you're not going to win that one. Yeah, the Har it comes from one of the Batman movies. The Harvey Dent coin is the one where it's heads on both sides. So when he says, okay, heads I win, tails you lose. Well, it's always going to land heads. So he's always going to win. You're always going to lose. That's, that's a bad thing. So a fair coin. So when I say a fair set of dice, same thing. The, the dice are such that one face of the dice is not more likely to land up or down than any other face because the weight distribution is even. And by the way, crooked dice are as old as time itself and gambling, you know, unfair devices. People figure out ways of cheating when it comes to games of chance. So it's redundant for us to say fair, but it'll always be a situation where it's fair because if it wasn't fair, then trying to calculate probabilities is extremely difficult. But if I have a fair coin where tail, heads and tails are equally likely, then I no longer have to worry about that aspect. If my coin was unfair, the calculating this probability would be extremely complicated, possible, but difficult. So first thing we're going to do is list the sample space S. I'm going to flip a coin three times. What are my possible outcomes? It looks like this. Heads, 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 tails. Heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, tails, tails. This looks kind of familiar. Where have we used this sort of reasoning and counting and logic and where have we seen that kind of thing? Tales. Truth tables. Yeah. Trues and falses. We did the same sort of thing. Okay. True, 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 false, true, false, true. We, we kept it in an organized way. You know, it's exactly how many outcomes are possible, by the way, if you count them. Exactly how many? Eight. Eight. Huh. Could we have, without knowing anything, could we have predicted the eight before we wrote them down? Hmm. I wonder. How do you get an eight? Flipping a coin three times. Where, 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 can an eight, where can an eight come from in that? Two to the power of three. Two to the power of three. Uh, what if I flip the coin four times, five times, 10 times? Do you, do you suppose maybe two to a power? Yeah, it turns out that's exactly correct. We don't know how to calculate that one quite yet, but we will. So the eight outcomes doesn't surprise me. Now, that's the exp this is the sample space of the experiment. What? Let's call, let's let A be the event, be the event two tails are tossed. I guess that would be the easiest way to say it. Or it landed tails twice. All right. So what is A? A is a set. A is not a value. So what would A be? Which of these would be an A? So look at all of the outcomes that have exactly two tails. That one. That one, that one. So if A is the event that exactly two tails are tossed, then A is H T T T H T T T H. Okay. If I say now, what's the probability of A occurring? Well, how many outcomes are there in A? One, two, three. How many outcomes in the sample space? You said eight. So the answer to the question is the probability, if I flip a coin three times, the probability of getting exactly two tails is three eighths. That's it. Now, if we calculate the probability of zero tails, the probability of one tail, the probability of two tails, and the probability of three tails, if we calculated each possible outcome, anybody would tell me anything about the individual probabilities without actually calculating them? 
what can you tell me about all the individual probabilities? What do you think? If I actually calculate the probability of zero tails, which would be that only, or the probability of three tails, which would be that only, or the probability of one tail, which is a few of the others. When I put those four answers together, anybody got an idea? Hmm. Calculate each conceivable probability in this experiment. Would it just be one? What would be one? The overall probability after adding them all together? The sum would be one. Yeah, there, you know, I'm not yes. going to get a probability of one on any outcome, but if I added up all of the possible probabilities, I should see one. Oh, okay. The probability of zero plus the probability of one plus the probability of two plus the probability of three tails, that should add up to one because I've covered everything. That, that should make sense. So if we were doing this sort of thing and, and I asked you, calculate each of the individual possibilities, zero, one, two, or three, you calculate all of them. If they don't add up to one, we have a problem, right? They say, okay, I'm, I'm missing something or I'm double counting something. So that's kind of an interesting, interesting notion here, right? So this is not a complicated process, but this is the beginnings of probability, okay? Fairly simple thing. So the idea of probability, first of all, okay, I'm gonna create the quotient. So now the goal, once we've defined probability, that's the easy thing. The goal now is the count. Because what if numerator and denominator are just complicated enough that I can't list them? Well, what do you mean they're just complicated enough? I'll give you an example, okay? I'm not a baseball fan, but I understand the mathematics. I believe a baseball team has like 25 people on a team. I think that's right. I don't know if it's changed. When I was a kid, it was always, there's 25 people on a team. There's nine people that are going to play at one time. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm the manager of the baseball team and I want to put my starting lineup out there. I want to put my nine players out on the field and then I'm going to put them up. Remember, this is called a batting order. So, you know, Sergey is going to bat first, let's say, you know, Dave's going to bat second and so on. I put my nine players. How many ways could I actually do that? If I got 25 people on the team, how many ways can I create a scenario where I put nine people in a starting lineup? Well, it actually turns out that's the number right there. Can everybody see that? See the little 11 on the side there? That's exactly how many lineups I could put. I put 25 guys on a team and I'm going to put nine guys on the field. The answer is, no, well, it's large. That's about three quarters of a trillion. Yeah, that's 741 billion. I'm going to show you how to calculate that today, actually. Um, so if I'm the manager, I'm probably not writing down all the possible lineups, you know, three quarters of a, of a trillion that might take me a little longer to do. So the thing is, is the listing of the outcomes is only possible if the sample space is really small. So we only write down the sample space on problems like this when it's really, really small so we can understand it. But in general, it's the calculation of the size of the sample space that's really the important thing because if a sample space is large, how do I count it? So we're going to go one of the very first and important principles of counting. It's called the matching or multiplication rule. Some textbooks will call it the matching rule. Some will call it the multiplication rule. It's the same thing. And the idea is I have several things that are going to occur and I want to know what is the overall count of how many outcomes I can possibly have. So I'm going to keep it really simple. I'm going to use myself as, a, as an example. Because when I get up in the morning and I choose what attire I'm going to wear for the day, you know, there, there are some really important choices I have to make. Well, actually, it's not really important choice. I just grab whatever shirt's on top. But let's just say I'm actually thinking about, you know, what shirt I'm going to wear today. So I first have to choose a shirt. So I have different colors I have to choose from. I have to choose which pair of shorts I'm going to wear because I'm always wearing my shorts. And then I have to choose, of course, you can't, you can't see from there. I have to choose my footwear. Oh, tennis shoes, sandals, maybe bare feet. These are some really important decisions I have to make on a daily basis. You have no idea the stress this can cause. Okay, so the question is, if I have all these different choices, exactly how many ways can I get dressed each day? So let's keep it simple. So let's suppose Mr. Brown, when he picks out his shirts, the choices he has, I'll keep it easy because today, this is green. I've got green, let's say I've got white, 
And let's say I've got um, Greg. Oh no, that won't, that won't work. Sorry, I'm trying to use a different. Uh, let's just let's just pretend that I have a red shirt. I, I I think I probably do. I'm looking at the first letters here. Now I got to do my shorts. Well, my shorts. I know I have a set of blue ones, and I have let's say. What, what, what color haven't I used? Um, although, although I don't, I'll, I'll use, I'll say orange, only because I, you know, oh. And then I've got the footwear. I can go with um, the current shoes I have now, let's say are black. I have another set of shoes definitely that are white. And I can always just go you would never know, but I could just go with socks. Okay, so here's the question. When Mr. Brown gets up in the morning, how many choices does he have to get dressed? Well, we're gonna do it, what's called a tree, okay? And I'm gonna list all of the conceivable outcomes. I'll just use first letters, that, that's why I did like that. So first thing is I have the, the shirts that I have to choose from. So this would be green, white, red and the next layer got to choose the shorts now the shorts can be hopefully i can give myself enough room to get out here the shorts can be blue or orange just in case you're wondering i got blue today and then from there we got to go with the footwear now the footwear can be black white or socks Now, at the end of each of these, sometimes people put like little little circles. They're often referred to as nodes. I don't, that's not really important. Point being, if I take any particular path, every single path is unique. There is no path that is exactly the same. So if I'm here, that meant that I had a white shirt, blue shorts, black shoes. That's what this represents. Whereas this one here is a red shirt, blue shorts, white shoes. Every single one of these nodes is an absolutely different outcome. In other words, it doesn't matter if two of the three things are the same. There is no outcome that are exactly the same. So if I said, how many ways can Mr. Brown get dressed in the morning? All you got to do is count the number of nodes. Okay. Which can be very impractical if these lists are long or if I have a lot more categories. So what is the final count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Hmm. How else could I have gotten the result of 18? Multiply. Multiply those choices. The matching or multiplication property in simple English says, if you have N1 ways of doing the first thing, and two ways of doing the second thing, up to nk ways of doing the kth thing. And each thing is completely separate. Like in other words, I chose my shirts, has nothing to do with my shoes. I have this many ways of doing the first thing, followed by this many ways of the second thing, all the way up to k. Then the number of outcomes that are possible is simply the product of these things. So the number of outcomes would be that. That's the number of outcomes. That's why it's called the matching principle, because I'm matching one outcome with the next outcome, or I'm multiplying them. No difference. Okay. So this is, this is a really, really huge one. And so what this one leads to is one of the most common types of probability experiments we look at. <clears throat> it's one of the simplest ones, and that is the rolls of the dice. Sir, can I ask a question quick? Um, yes, so the, the, key, the key here, what, what does it mean, the key? That means there's, there's K choices. So in the last example, I did shirts, shorts, shoes. That's three different categories. So there would be an N1, an N2, and an N3. Mm -hmm. What if I said also, because uh, I have multiple sets of glasses, and I, I have to now match it with which pair of glasses I want. That would have been a fourth category. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. But let's suppose let's suppose this is a toupee. You know, it's not. But let's. So I have I have now also what 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 wig do I want to throw on there? Yeah, you know, we could we could have fun. Just keep going on the. You know, I have the belt I'm going to wear. I have multiple choices. As I keep adding categories, I'm going to multiply by that many choices. So that's why. I did this problem with a tree diagram because the problem was small. But if the problem were really, really large, I'm still going to multiply. That's that's the whole point. In so, our case, in our case, the the k was three. Is there were three categories exactly. Three. Okay. So I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to create this dice roll chart. Sometimes I'll actually put this on an exam so you don't have to. If I roll a pair of fair dice, a die is a cube, so it has six sides or faces, we usually call them. And every time I roll, every conceivable outcome where I'm matching the two numbers together turns out is equally possible. Now, what is not equally possible are the sums of the dice. <laughs> exactly how many possible dice rolls are there? Exactly how many um, roll the dice? How many possible rolls are there? If I'm just looking at the numbers. Six. Oh, you're talking to 36. 36. Now, could you have told me 36 before I actually wrote those? Yes. Yeah, because you say I've got one through six on first die. I have one through six on the second. What am I going to do? I'm going to match them. Oh, okay. Six from the first matched with six from the second. And that, that's pretty easy. Agreed? So when we're rolling the dice, the outcome of five, three is just as likely as the outcome of one, six, because all 36 rolls are equally likely. But when you roll the dice, typically, what are you going to do with the two numbers you see, typically, if you're rolling the dice? Add them. Yeah, you're playing Monopoly. You're going to add them, aren't you? Oh, I'm, I'm playing craps. I'm going to, I'm probably going to add them. So what are the possible sums if I roll the dice? <clears throat> what are the possible sums? Two categories here. Well, two to, 12. two to 12. Oh, shoot. Hold on. <laughs> Not quite going to fit them all in there. 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 at the bottom. All right. Are all of the sums equally likely? Hmm. Well, how many ways can you roll a total of two? Exactly how many of these give you a total of two? Just one. Just that one. So there's only, if I said, what is the probability? Would you agree that it's simply one out of 36? Yep. But now if I said, how many ways can I roll a total of three? There's two different ways. Oh. How about a total of four? See how I cleverly segregated these outcomes? I believe that would be three over 36. And we can keep going. Four out of 36. Five out of 36. Six out of 36. Rolling a total of seven is six times as likely as rolling a total of two. Now, so eight, it'd be seven out of 36, right? No, it went the other way. Now I'm back to five out of 36, four out of 36, three out of 36, two out of 36, and finally at the bottom, one out of 36. Without even doing so, if I add up all these probabilities, what will they add up to? What one. do you know they're going to have to? They're going to add up to one. Yeah, absolutely correct. So if you're doing dice rolls, every one of these outcomes is equally likely, but the sums are not because there are six different ways I can get a sum of seven. Okay, so although each individual outcome is equally likely, the sums are not. And that's important we understand the difference between the two because there were six different 
did six different combinations of numbers that produced a total of seven. So when you're doing games of chance, let's just say you're playing Monopoly. OK, and where you want to go on the board is, you know, six away or 12 away. Well, six is far more likely than 12 because there's several ways I can roll a total of six, but only one way I can roll a total of 12. So uh, dice games in general really rely on understanding these probabilities. I, I'm now, again, I'm not I'm not a gambler, but I will teach you a lot of the facts about gambling. Does anybody know the game of craps? That's like one of the oldest gambling games there is, actually. Game of craps. Did anybody know that one? I've heard of it, but I forgot. <laughs> Crap. Yeah. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of craps. I'm going to start playing the game. Okay. So I'm going to roll the dice. Whenever I roll, I roll. Okay. Now, let's say I roll a total of five, I roll a total of nine or whatever. That's called my point. Whatever I roll, that's called my point. Now, I'm going to roll again until either I get my point or I get seven or 11. Okay, that's how it works. I'm going to roll until I get my point or I get seven or 11. Um, so if I said the seven or 11, if I said how many ways, well, there's six sevens and there's two 11s. So of all the rolls on the dice, eight of them are going to be sevens or 11s. So if I start, by the way, if I start with the seven or 11, if I start with the seven or 11, I win right off the bat. But if I don't, I, let's say I roll a total of nine, right? Roll a total of three. Every possible outcome I roll is now less likely than the seven or 11. So I'm more likely to get a seven or 11 than I am to get my point. Therefore, winning is not, you know, it's not easy to win. But that's, that's kind of the Reader's Digest version of it. And, and it's a very simple game to play, play over and over again. So I can ask all sorts of questions. What's the probability of, you know, and then, and then we can break it down. If I said, okay, I'm going to roll the dice. For those of you who have played Monopoly, right? Is there any roll that you don't want three times in a row for all Monopoly players? What don't I want to do three times in a row? Get a uh, same number on both dice. That's, what is that called? Do we know what it's called? Pair. Doubles. doubles, yeah. I don't want to get doubles three times in a row. Well, is that very likely? Well, what's the probability? I'm going to roll the dice one time. Can you tell me the probability of rolling a doubles? Six out of 36. Perfect. Yeah, that's the probability. So, oh, one out of six times I roll the dice, I'm going to roll a doubles. That's, that's not microscopic. You know, I don't want to bet the mortgage on rolling doubles, but one out of six is when you're rolling the dice a lot. You know, my wife and I play backgammon all the time. Backgammon is a game... Yes, you're interested in the sum, but you're also you're even more interested in the in individual uh, rolls because, you know, if I roll a four or three, that means I can move four and I can move three. But if I roll a five, two, I, I can move five and I can move a two and maybe there's things in the way. So in other words, it's not just the total of seven spaces I move. I have to individually be able to move each of those numbers. It's, it's a little more complicated. But when you roll a doubles in, in backgammon, doubles are wonderful. I mean, we love doubles. But the probability isn't as high. So with a dice roll, it's very easy to calculate probabilities because I can see every outcome. Where this could get a little bit tricky, okay? Um, how many have ever played the game Yahtzee? Anybody ever heard that game? Yep, yep. Yes. It's a really old game. It's a dice game. How many dice are you playing with in Yahtzee? Anybody remember? Six, I think, or four? Five. Five. Or five. <laughs> um, are, are there any really popular card games that have five cards? Can you think of any popular card games that have five cards? Um, what's it called? Poker. Poker. I'm poking you. Poker. <laughs> Yahtzee is a dice game that mimics poker. You have five dice. In poker, you have five cards. In Yahtzee, you can have three of a kind, four of a kind, four. You can have all the same kind of names. But in Yahtzee, if I said, well, can you, can you list the possible outcomes? There were 36 outcomes here. How many outcomes are possible in the Yahtzee? You may want to guess. Without calculating, how many outcomes are possible in Yahtzee if there's five dice? Six to the fifth. Six yeah. to the fifth, yeah. So it's... 
Oh, I don't want to write those down. <laughs> one, 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 two. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's there's seven thousand seven hundred seventy six outcomes. That's I, I don't want to write those down. I have to know how to calculate those. That's why we love this one, because I can write it down. Yes, I could calculate the thirty six. So when the problem is bigger, I'm not going to write it down. I just have to be able to calculate it. So six to the fifth power possible outcomes if you're playing a game of Yahtzee because you're rolling the dice, but you're not going to write them down. It would take you too long. Okay. So with that said, <clears throat> now we want to remind ourselves of some, some other really basic facts again, that we already know in some cases. Now, let's suppose, let's, I, I like using things like license plates. License plates are fun to, to use for for combinatorics, that's the counting part. Because everybody knows what a license plate looks like and they know the restrictions and the limitations. So a typical license plate will be a sequence of what? Anybody? Letters and numbers. Letters and numbers, yeah. Capital letters and numbers. The capital letters, are there any restrictions on the letters or are all 26 letters optional? Are they all available? I no, they're all available. You, can't, you can't use a Q or you know, are there any restrictions on the on the letters you can use? No. All 26. Are there any restrictions on the numbers? No. Zero through nine. So I have 10 digits. I have 26 numbers. Now, there was a time. There was a time when it was three letters followed by three numbers. Okay. How many choices did you have for the first letter? You just said 26. How about the second? Well, 26. How about the third? Oh, 26. Then it was followed by three numbers. So how many choices did you have? 10. So if I said how many license plates were possible, multiply this bad boy out. I said this piece of cake. The answer is 17 million. 576,000, there are that many different license plates possible in the state of California. How many cars do you think right now, just right now, not ever, today, how many cars are in the state of California? More or less than this. Equals. <laughs> you think there's this many cars in California or more? I would say there's probably more. Significantly. Yeah, it's closer like one per person. See, don't forget certain things. Not only, so well, I don't have five cars. There's company cars. You ever go to a car lot? You ever, oh, you ever go to the rental car at the airport? And yeah, there's probably double this in California. Oh, by the way, can a license plate ever be used a second time? Whatever your license plate is on your car, will that license plate ever be used again? No. And we're going back to the beginning of cars. So if we said, how many cars have there been in the state of California? More than 10 times this. So we have a problem. If we can't reuse numbers, hold on, let me get rid of that. Okay. If we can't reuse any license plate, what do we do? Well, there was a time when there were only this. So what we did was we, we put something there. If you go back out and look at your car, what is the first thing? Is it a letter or is it a number? A number. A number. It is a number. Oh, so we put numbers in front. So now how many more choices do we have? 10 times more. Oh, so what did, what did we just do to the possible number of license plates? We did this, which by the way, um, does anybody know the first number on theirs? Eight. Mine's eight. Seven. seven. Yeah, I, I have one car seven. with a six in my, and one car with a seven. And some of you have cars with an eight. Does anybody have a car with a nine? You know what you can think of that number as? A ticking clock. In other words, each time we recycle, that number goes up one. That number is going to be nine soon. Then what's going to happen? What, what is going to happen in the state of California? Then another number to the front. Exactly. We'll have to. No way. That's why we added that one in the first place. So why didn't they, didn't they add a letter instead of number to increase? You, you know what? I wasn't there, Sergey, but it seems to me that would have made a lot more sense 
to put 26 there instead of 10. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. So maybe when we run out, maybe instead of numbers, they'll put a letter there. Because again, then it will be a unique sequence of letters and numbers. But this, this is a pretty simple thing, isn't it? Now, that the fact that you can have, and by the way, we're not talking about specialized ones where you have you know, the cool word in front, you know, great. That's like, everybody loves that one, right? Just, this is how many possibilities there are, but no one's gonna write them down. You just want to be able to calculate them. Now, another one that's really easy to work with is phone numbers. So now we think about phone numbers. Again, I'll, I'll just start with California. I don't need the whole United States. So when I think of a phone number, you know, we have a dash in front. Is the dash even relevant when you're talking about your phone number? No. So when, when I can say my phone number is, you know, 493-6017. So when you're typing that number in your phone, you, of course, pause because that's where the dash is. Does the dash mean anything? No, the dash is there, so it makes it easier for you to remember the phone number. If I just gave you seven numbers in a row really fast, it'd be harder for you to remember. It has nothing to do with when you're typing it in. Now, let's suppose for a moment there are no restrictions whatsoever. We know there are, but let's suppose there are no restrictions. Then how many possible phone numbers are there? Seven to the ten. Other way. Ten to the seven. <laughs> ten to the seventh. Well, how big is ten to the seventh? Well, a million is 10 to the six, so that's 10 million. That's a lot of phone numbers. Um, how many phone numbers do you suppose there are in the state of California? If you just had to make a wild guess, just, just off the top of your head, just California. Do you think it's more or less than that? More. We have 40, right at 40 million people. And we want to guess, just, just give a random logic. What do you think is a logical guess? If there's about 40 million people in California. It's a probably, about, probably about double that. It's probably about 80 million. What? Well, let's put it this way. In my household, in, in my household alone, we have eight different phone numbers. I have two different work phone numbers. When you call Mesa College, how many different phone numbers are there just for Mesa College and all the extensions? In the district, there's maybe a thousand phone numbers. Those aren't individual people. People have their own phone numbers. People forget things like cell phones. What about business phone numbers? Oh, yeah. There are so many more phone numbers than there are people. Why is that a problem? Oh, and by the way, phone numbers can be reused. That's why you get wrong numbers a lot of times because you have a phone number that used to be somebody else's phone number. Uh, but you have area codes too, which... Is... This is why you have area codes. There was a time, by the way, before area codes a long time ago, you know, 1940s, 1950s. So what does the area code do? How many numbers are in the area code? There's, three. There's another, oh, now I'm up to 10 to the 10th. That's awesome. Why? Because that's 10 billion. Okay, that's a little bit better. Are we going to run out of phone numbers in California soon? No. But that is not... Oh, Correct. area codes are not for California. Area codes are for the entire United States. Oh, so in the entire United States, 10 billion, that's a lot of phone numbers, but there's 340 million people with all the different, you know, think, think of government agencies. Is we're, By the way, we're, we haven't reached this, but that's actually not that far away, is it? So basically that's not terribly far away. That's in the United States. Doesn't, don't other countries have phones? <laughs> um, so we, we, we have more things. So what, <clears throat> we talked about restrictions. Are there restrictions? Yes, there are. When I call you now, by the way, a couple of years ago, this wasn't the case. I, I'm in the 858 area code. Let's say you're my next door neighbor. You're in the 858 area code. When I called you, I just dialed your seven digit number. That's all that ever had to do. It's only been a couple of years really that we had to start dialing the area code also. I know because on my cell phone, I had no area codes in front of people's phone numbers. I had to go in, back and insert them. So we, we changed the way we call people. So what's the first number you always enter in your phone when you call anybody now? 
one. You, put a one. you do a one. Therefore, are there restrictions on phone numbers? Yes, your phone number can't start with a one. I want to dial and I want to call my friend in Canada. What do I, what's the first number I'm going to enter? Do I know? One. Well, I tell to Canada and I use one. Zero. When you're making an international call, you do zero. In fact, you do two zeros, I think, in, in a lot of cases. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, there are restrictions. So, therefore, the are there restrictions on the first number in your phone? Yes, there are. It can't be a zero or a one. So, that means we only had that many, perhaps. Or did we? Well, if I start with a zero or a one, then actually everything's fair game. So, that's not the case. But the point is... If I want to calculate now, are there restrictions in general on phone numbers in general, only on the first digit, but since you now dial the one first, then when you get to the area code area, and the reason they did this is because we don't want to run out of area codes. We want area codes to be able to have other numbers. Now, what's another sequence of numbers that is that everybody should know because we all have something in common. What's, is there another sequence of numbers? Everybody has one. Social security. Social security. Oh. Now, when you give your social security, again, you have the dashes, but there's actually no, the dash is for just to help you remember it. That's it. That, that you don't actually type in a dash when you're typing your social security number. So social security numbers, 10, 10, 10. This was easy because there's nine numbers. How many possible social security numbers if there are no restrictions whatsoever? How many possible? 10 to the power of nine. 10 to the power of nine. How big is that? That's one big. big. That's, that's huge. Is it huge enough? Yep. Well, there's about 340 million Americans right now. And everybody has a social security number. If you're in the United States, you have a social security number but you can't reuse social security numbers. Oh, so once you get yours, it's yours for life, it's yours after you die, <laughs> nobody else is gonna get it. And social security numbers have been around since the 1930s, I believe. So although there's only 340 million people currently alive, we've had several hundred million people take their social security numbers with them. In other words, we are actually quickly running out of available social security numbers. Yikes. So at some point, what might happen, do you suppose? Add another number. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Maybe a letter. I don't know. Now, are there restrictions on social security numbers? I always love this one because I, I love the answers I get. Are there restrictions on social security numbers? Are there any numbers that you can't have, for example? Well, on phone numbers, we know your individual phone number can't start with a zero or a one. It's, that's always been the case. Are there any restrictions on socials? Anybody know? Uh, isn't the last four like different for everyone? Well, the whole sequence of nine has to be different for everyone. No, the last four can't be different for everyone because there's only 10 to the fourth. There's only 10,000 last fours. There's 340 million people and there's only 10,000 different last fours. So there, there are tens of thousands of people probably that have my last four, but nobody has my whole nine. Ah, are there any restrictions on socials? Hmm. How many, um, how many people's social security number starts with a five? Just say mine, just yell it out. Okay. How many start with a five? Anybody? Mine does. Okay. Anybody start with a six? Mine does, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most people in California have a five or a six. I've had people tell me, no, there are certain numbers you can't start with. Um, was anybody here born in New England? Any New Englanders here? Okay, my wife was born in Connecticut. She, didn't, she was born there. She didn't live there. Do you know her social security number starts with? Zero. In other words, social security numbers are geographic. New England starts with zero and it works this way across the country. I, I don't know who starts with a nine or who starts with a two or three, but I know New Englanders are all zeros. That sounds terrible, I know, but. <laughs> so if you, if you see a zero in front of somebody's number, you actually know where they were born. If you see a five, they were probably born in California. That's, that's what makes it a little bit easier from that standpoint. But we're gonna run out of these, but here's the cool thing, we can calculate these. 
it's real easy. So we can add later. So I've been doing all these examples with no restrictions. So here's the question. And I'm going to do this in a little bit. I want to make up my own phone number. I want to have some fun. I, I want to, you know, I want to do this. And I don't want any restrictions on my phone number. But here's the thing. I want to help have a phone number, but the, I'm going to give you one restriction. I don't ever want to use the same number twice. So my phone number can be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It can be zero nine eight seven six five four. It, it can be one three five seven nine two four. I think that works. You can have any phone number you want. You just can't use the same number twice. How many phone numbers would be possible if I threw that restriction? Hmm. Well, let's add 10 choices for the first number. But now how many do I have for the second number? That'd just be a pictorial, like nine, eight, seven, six. It's something like that. But so how many would be the second number? You agree? Nine? Nine. Then and eight, seven. eight. And seven, and then six, and then five, and then four. All right. So that's that's my answer. I would multiply all those out. We would do that. So, oops, try that again. And that would be a really large number. That'd be 604,800. I just multiplied it out. That, that took a little while, but I like what you said. You said something about factorials. The problem is I can't do a factorial. Why can't I do a factorial? It doesn't go down to one. Yeah. What if I... If I did this, hey everybody, look over there real quick. Oh wow, look what I just did. I made a factorial. Can I just arbitrarily multiply by three times two times one? Well, of course not. It wouldn't be the same value unless I oh, what if I did that? Why would I do such a thing? Well, how many of you want to enter? 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four into your calculator. Nobody does. But isn't this the same as 10 factorial over three factorial? Do you agree that's the same answer? By the way, you can do that on your calculator. Yep. Oh, okay, so this is the segue into the next thing because we, we want to be able to do things quickly and easily. I don't want to enter seven numbers in a product on my calculator if I don't have to. That's way faster. So first thing is, you know, n distinct objects. This is important. We say distinct. I don't have a hundred ping pong balls. They all look exactly the same. So if I start organizing and arranging them, I can't tell the difference. No, I have n books on my shelf and they're all different. I have n people in the classroom. Obviously you're all different. I have n distinct objects. That just means I can tell them apart. Okay, how many arrangements How many arrangements? Well, I have for the first object, I'm going to put them in order. I have n for the first object, just like I had 10 choices for the first number. Now, once I've selected the first object, how many objects are left? n minus one. So that's how many choices I have for the second position. Now that I've chosen the first two positions, how many objects are left? n minus two. And I'm going to do this all the way till I get to the last. Boom. And that number is what? N factorial. N factorial. This is where factorials come from. This is actually the definition of a factorial to begin with. The number of ways of arranging n distinct objects is n factorial. Okay. So if I had five books and you wanted to put them in order, there's five factorial or 120 ways I can put five books in order. And every time I, well, what if I took the last two and switched them? That's now a different order for the set of five books. Every time you make one change, it's a different order. So if I put n objects in order, there's exactly n factorial. That's it. There's nothing ambiguous about that statement. That's where factorials come from. And if n is large, obviously you're going to use your calculator to do that. But that's not what I did here. I didn't take 10 and put 10 in order. I selected some of the 10. Okay, so if there's n factorial arrangements of n objects, now let me throw one at you. Okay. I have n distinct objects. Select 
R of them, R being less than or equal to N, of course, and put them in order. That, by the way, um, I'm going to use those words. There's another statement that means exactly the same thing. That means arrange them or arrangement. When you hear the term arrangement, that means things in order. If I just said, I'm going to grab a handful of things from a jar and put them in my pocket, I'm not putting them in order. I'm just taking a whole bunch at once. I have a set of cards, just grab a whole bunch at one time. I'm not putting those things in order. But I said, no, I, I'm going to grab some number from my list of n things, and I'm going to put them in a very, very specific order. Okay, how many ways can I do this? And the key is the word here is arrangement. That, that's a very, very important, not just English, but it's a mathematical word. So it's not n factorial anymore. It's what I just did here. Now, I didn't select three things here. I selected seven things, right? I selected seven numbers from my phone number. So where does the three come from? N minus R. Yeah, that would be the three came from doing 10 minus seven, didn't it? Does everybody see that? Oh, so if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have N choices for the first times N minus one times N minus two dot, dot, dot. And eventually I'm going to get N, excuse me, N minus R plus one. I selected seven objects here. See the four? That's 10 minus seven plus one. Because then what follows this? If I, wanted to, if I wanted to complete the factorial, I would need, what's the next integer less than this? It would be N minus R. Does everybody see that? If I want to complete the factorial, so in this case, that was a four. So I then did one less, three factorial. This is how I can complete the factorial. Ah. And that's exactly what I have here. And this is a formula. And it is an extremely useful formula. So the formula, I have n distinct objects. I want to select r of them and put them in order. I want to, so in other words, we want to arrange our objects. Then the formula is n factorial over n minus r factorial. An English word that means the exact same thing as arrangement. Does anybody know there's an English word that means the same thing as arrangement, but we use it in the mathematical context. It's called a permutation. And what's interesting to me is a lot of people don't realize the word permutation means arrangement. That's it. Permutation doesn't have some hidden mathematical meaning. It just means arrangement. Permutations, arrangement. So to permute means to arrange. Permute is a verb, permutation is a noun. Permutation is arrangement. So how many permutations or how many arrangements? The word permutation implies there is order. There's something else when it's not order. We'll get to that one a little bit later. That's, that's a huge one. So if I wanna put things in order, I'm saying how many ways can I put things in order? How many permutations are there? So we often refer to this formula this way. We say capital P N comma R. That's one notation. I'm gonna show you in textbooks, they use different notations. Sometimes they'll use this. And sometimes they'll use this. <laughs> it's a little confusing. It depends on the author. They all mean exactly the same thing. So on my calculator, I have a key and the key on my calculator looks like this. But if you have a higher level calculator, maybe a graphing calculator or a calculator where you actually have to go um, uh, select menu options and stuff, very likely might have this one. It, it doesn't matter. When you see the capital P and the two numbers, that means permutation. The reason that can be a little confusing is we are using capital P for probability, but the context is different. If I said, what's the probability of an event? I said, capital P of event A. Permutation involves two inputs. So there's no way I'm gonna confuse this with probability. Oh, N objects, I'm choosing R of them. So really simply, I wanna say I have a hundred objects and I want to 
choose five to put in order. Okay, that would be permutation. And I, I like using this notation personally, it's just easier to read. Now, what I don't have to do is change it to the factorials, but I can. So what's my numerator? Anybody? Be 100. Be 100. Factorial. Factorial, yeah. And my denominator? Uh, 95 factorial. 95, yeah, not five, but 95. Okay, so enter that into your calculator, everyone. Everybody do 100 factorial divided by 95 factorial. Tell me what you get. Do 100, enter 100 factorial divided by 90, 95 factorial. Um, did all your calculators fail you hopelessly just now? Mine did. Yeah, why, why does all of your calculators say error? There's nothing wrong with the question. Crazy. Because 100 factorial exceeds the capacity of your calculator unless, unless of course, you have the word titanium. Yeah. That calculator can do what I asked you, but this calculator, no. This cal most calculators have a limit, believe it or not, of only 69 factorial because 70 factorial is on the order of 10 to the hundredth power. Oh, and a calculator can't do that. But yet, this is really easy to do. I'm going to do this right now on my calculator. On my cheap handheld calculator, I'm going to do this. And the answer, so I can't read my answer. My answer is right here. I'm trying to read that. How many? Nine billion. 34,502,400, that's the answer. Wait, that, how, wait, I thought you couldn't do this. No, you can't do this, but you can do this. I want you to calculate this without using the factorial key. So wouldn't we all do the following? Wouldn't we say 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 times 95 factorial? over 95 factorial. Wouldn't we all do that naturally? So when I enter this into my calculator, my calculator calculated this. When I enter these individually in my calculator, it exceeds the capacity of my calculator. So you don't want to enter factorials. You actually want to enter the, the permutation key. So you need to find that key on your individual calculator. On, on my cheap calculator, it's a second function key on here. If you have a fancier calculator, you're probably gonna to have to go to a menu and your menu will usually be where you also find the factorials and you look, just look for the big P. This is a simple, trivial calculation, but you need to know how to do it on your calculator because the one thing you don't wanna do, you don't wanna do this. You can, you don't wanna do it. It's, it's, it's too much entering, right? It's easier to just hit the permutation key. So that's the beautiful thing is when you use the permutation key, your calculator is already gonna cancel and just calculate what's left. If I enter it as factorials, then I have to calculate the factorials separately. And that may be an overwhelming proposition. Okay, that may be just a little bit too big. Okay, any question on, on this? Okay, so permutation is a fairly simple thing. You don't do a whole lot with permutations because putting things in order may or may not be important. Now, if anybody here has ever played bingo, Everybody know what a bingo is? Bingo, you've got the big board and you got all the little squares with numbers and letters. And, you know, you old people play bingo. If you ever watch Better Call Saul, right? You got to start you know, playing bingo with the old folks. Okay, so bingo is a game. Now, there's a gambling game for bingo. In a casino, you can gamble at bingo. And what's that game called? It's not called bingo. You may know what that game is called. It's the same game. The gambling version of bingo I know you guys would never do this, but everybody here has disreputable friends who probably have done this and you've heard stories from them. Anybody? Nobody? It's called Kino. Kino is the gambling version of bingo. And it's the same thing. You have a selection and there's little squares. This comes just numbers and you say, uh, I'm gonna buy four squares. I'm gonna buy six squares or whatever. You buy them. And then when all the ping pong balls come up and you get them, you win lots of money. Now there's a non-gambling legal version of Kino that is in every state in the United States. It has another name. Anyone guess what that name's called? 
big board of numbers and you select them and hopefully you win. The lottery. lottery. The lottery. <laughs> it's the same game. Bingo, Kino, the lottery are all exactly the same games. The thing is, though, when you select your numbers, you, you let's say you have the big board. Let's just say there were 100 numbers and you're picking, you know, seven of them. I don't, I don't know how I don't, I don't play a lottery. You're picking seven of them. So I'm going to pick one, five and 13. Is that different from picking 13, five and one? Is that different? Or five, 13 and one or one, 13 and five? When I fill out that board, I have all of my selections made. Can you tell what order I selected them in? No, you can just tell which ones I selected. Be kind of like, I'm going to pick five of you to be on the first ever discrete basketball team. If you're one of the five chosen, it's not important if you were the first one chosen or the fifth one chosen. You're just one of the five chosen. That would not be a permutation because there's no order. So in the case of filling out the Kino or the lottery ticket, you're not putting them in order. You're just making your selection. That's a very, very different calculation. We're going to do that one. Uh, we're going to do that one, I think. Hold on. We're going to do, oh, that's going to be the recorded lecture on Friday. <laughs> it's going to be that one. Um, that's probably the biggest one of all of them. Okay. So I'm going to leave you with this. Nothing we did today should be.